Hello, we're very honoured today to have someone so highly respected on the podcast. I'll just read you an email that was sent to me from Ian Blink MacDonald. I know you guys have watched his podcasts on the channel, two of them now, hundreds of thousands of views. And here's what Ian just emailed me about Vic. Vic was a good pal and was in the next cell to meet in full Sutton. And I remember when the three guys got shot dead. Vic said he knew Pat Tate. He was also good at martial arts and would take me and the guys into the TV room and show us some self-defense moves. He would say, Ian, try and stab me with this plastic knife. And before I knew it, I would be flying over his shoulder. I spent time with him in Long Lawton as well. So yeah, so Blink, and, and both uh, Steve Rafe as well said to tell you hello and Oh, thank you so. very much for coming on. Yeah, Ian's a very nice person. He was a good friend of mine in, uh, when in the prison system and a respected guy. He's yeah. a right nice bloke. Yeah. You know, and uh, no, he's a Scotsman. But it's all right. <laughs> it's a joke, Ian. <laughs> so, no, he was a lovely fellow. He was, in. He was. Yeah, and if people are not familiar with Vic, he served over two decades in prison. Highest categories, double A in the UK, it's called like Supermax. Only a few people in that category in the whole country and if you've watched the james english the link is in the description box and he's also been on danny dyer's deadliest men link to that is also in the description box as well so the east end then was where you grew up yeah basically yeah when i was a kid my dad was um, a maltese immigrant he uh, actually come to the country he was dad was an english sailor so he, he met me mum and then obviously I was born in 1957. So at the time, obviously, him being Maltese, it was Maltese and the craze and things like that. So I sort of grew up in that era, really, you know, in the in the craze era. Yeah. Yeah, which gave us the old school beliefs as we grew up. So what, so what are the old school beliefs? Elk the granny across the road. Don't grasp on your fellow competitors. Elk the community, basically, and don't rob from the poor. Obviously, we was robbing from the banks, like and social, like security vans, things like that. So we wasn't ever taking it out on the, on the public. You know, we was taking it against the government, basically. You know, that's what we was doing when I grew up, and that's how we was taught. We wouldn't break into a, a person's house, a working class person's house. So that's what the old school was really, and which sorry to say is on its way out now. Yeah. So you didn't have much growing up, and you saw in other neighbourhoods things people had. Yeah, basically, what happens when uh, when you're poor? This is the problem. What we have got today, you got like super rich, and you got the super poor. So when when I was poor, like not being, I'm not gonna sit here. My me, me, me brother's a millionaire now, so and I, we ain't short of a few quid. But like we've been through the poverty line, and it ain't nice. I mean, you you know, you walk past and you see a, a bit of ham in a shop, and you think, I wish I had that instead of a tin. A, you know, like having tin of baked beans and pie and, like mash was like and spam at my time when I was a kid now you say that to a kid now he turn his nose up and you think well, bloody hell you know but things have changed you know you've got better you're better now than what we did in the 50s you know it's like kids are more got more now than what we had put it that way so a lot of people from that neighbourhood didn't turn to crime you just gave the example of your brother yeah. running this successful business yeah what was different then for you that you think that made you go down that path? Well, when, you, when you're a kid and you go to school and then we didn't have, it all starts off like school uniforms and that sounds stupid and you can, we couldn't really afford school uniforms so I'd go and nick them from the shop, you know, and that sounds stupid. So you grew up in... Um, all the kids, you know, it's what kids had and you didn't have, which is what we got today. And that's the problem, you know, you live in a in a block of flats and you've got nothing and you go to a big house and you see someone who's got everything. I mean, that kid who's got nothing, he wants it. And that's where the society, we've got a problem with society until it evens out a bit, you know. So, And that's what happened when I, when I was a kid. Because me personally, at the time, as you said, I was doing a lot of martial arts and I turned it into, which I shouldn't have done, was armed robberies and things like that, you know. So what made you start martial arts? A lot of people like do it because they get bullied or things like that. What, what motivated you? Um, I was going to start boxing and then what happened? Bruce Lee came out. I know it sounds stupid. Well, I was about 13. 
and um, he was watching. And I just, I, I, I joined a karate club, and then went into kickboxing and things like judo and and learn how to look after yourself, basically, which turned out good for me later on in my life, basically, you know. But getting back to being poor, being poor is most worst thing in the world. I mean, you wake up in the morning. And like even in society now, you watch about now the viruses. Have you watch how many people are going to be evicted? You know, and, and when you're living in that type of environment, you can see where poverty causes crime. Do you know what I mean, Sean? You know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's um, a major factor is like the discrepancy in society between the rich and the poor, and the war on drugs and the rest of it, and all the profits that the prisons are making from locking people up. But we're going we're, we're going to get to that. Um, so, just going back to the martial arts again then. Martial arts, some people, you know, they've got this aggression about them and martial arts kind of tempers that and makes them channel it in a, in a more positive way. Did you find that with yourself? Did you have a kind of aggression in you? Did you have an anger at, at, at anything when you were younger? I think, I think what it is, it t takes the bully out of you without a doubt because I had an instructor who's very, very uh, strict. And he's slagged me off for having tattoos and you know, and he was like uh, he's like a bit of a father father figure really, because he'd go, Don't do that and he'd teach you and then you and he'd, he'd give you that sort of and, and we we he taught you to look after yourself. You respected him because he was like seventh down at the time. He was like European wow. champion. I won't mention his name. His name's first name was Peter, but he was a bit tasty. So you, you had that sort of look up to him when I was a kid, you know. So getting back to poverty, um, the reason why I did take it up really is just better myself in looking after myself, basically. Because obviously, you know, on the streets, being an East End boy, it was it weren't like uh, you, you know, you, if you didn't fight, you was in trouble, you know. So that, yeah. that was the problem you had. So did you did the streets teach you how to fight then before karate? Were you already rough and tumble? Not really. Not nothing to when you go into martial arts how they teach you to punch properly. The only problem is when you do punch properly, you've got more chance to get a prison sentence because when you hit someone, you're going to break a bone or a chin or, you know, so really basically kids out there today, if they want to do some anger, go to the gyms, take it out in the gyms, the boxing, the cry. It's a, it's a good way of un unleashing your anger, basically. That's why I tell them you got to channel your energy into positive things, boxing, karate, martial arts. Yeah, or your brains, you know, your brains going on computers, you know, ch challenges into something. Yeah, but getting back to poverty, I think when I grew up, um, I didn't like it. You know, I didn't like I didn't like not having no money. It was it was horrible. You know, I had that horrible look down on you that sort of um, how can you explain it? You felt that people looked down on you. Mm. One because we lived behind a junk shop. Yeah. One, my dad was Maltese. He looked like he's look Asian looking, like a. A packy type, look like skin type packy. So, my dad so were you experiencing racism because of that then? Yeah, I did. Yeah, because but but because my mum was ginger, so I didn't have much going for me. <laughs> my mum was ginger, my dad was Maltese, you know. So, uh, yeah. so at that time, there weren't many foreigners in the country. So it was really um, you growing up in that environment and like not having no money at all. It was like sort of you, you without you knowing it, and you look back in psychology where I was in prison. I went through the psychology courses and that, and that's what gives you the chip on your shoulder without you even knowing it. Do you know what I mean, Sean? Yeah. You know, even to this day, like if someone has a go at you, you still think, you know, you're still like, you know, you know, in your mind, you say, "Don't do that," yeah. but you're still in your mind, even at sixty three, you think, "Fuck, you know, I'm having that." You know, it's just, mm -hmm. it's just that's ingrained at you since you was a kid, basically. Yeah. That lay down and die spirit. You know, it's, I wish you, you got it, but you haven't got it. I was in Tesco's, that guys, and this geezer kept walking, you know, the sick two metre rule. And the geezer kept, I'm, I'm waiting for him to go. And every time I went up, he'd come back and he'd done it three times on the third time. And I thought, you do that the fourth time, I'm going to knock you out, you know. <laughs> but you, that's what I'm saying. And I'm thinking, I'm 63 years old. Yeah. And it's just, though you want to lose that sort of, um, that bit in you but you can't really mm. because that from a child you know you just can't help it that's what happens with kids they're sort of molded at early age you can't turn like a posh kid into a criminal mm. can you yeah do you see what i'm saying yeah and that's what happens because they come up through the ranks and that's how they get into what they are all criminality yeah and this why please go through the interview i want to explain if we can try and stop people from going into crime absolutely picking up the knives yeah you know yeah. if we can just get something out of it and mm -hmm. turn their lives around if we can help in that way, it'd be fantastic this interview. You know? Yeah, yeah, we're going to have a really strong message about that, definitely. So you were experiencing um, 
discrimination of sorts then as a young person. You've not got much money. You're channeling your energy into martial arts. Now, when you're first doing the karate and you're getting fights, you're doing the sparring, how is that making you feel? Uh, confident. Right away you were confident. Yeah, quite confident, yeah, because you hit hard and you and you and you cope taking people down, you know. So, and which went on to when you got into armed robberies and things like that, coming without hurting people, you could put people down without hurting them. Basically, you could wrap someone up quite easy, you know. So, uh, and that's what you was taught. Not so much now because I've had a hip, hip replacement because of karate and judo yeah. and all that because of sports. So, um, yeah, it was a. I wouldn't turn me back on the sport. I think it's a good thing to put your kids into, mm -hmm. especially for respect and take the bully out of them, basically. Yeah. How long were you doing karate for? I done karate for four and a half years. Then we went into an underground kickboxing, which there weren't many weight categories. So I'd done that for a couple of years. That's how I lost the top of me and got my teeth broken and broke my toes because he was fighting bigger people at the time. I was only like a middleweight. And, uh, and, you, and you find a, a heavyweight and you get punched on the nose, you obviously know about it, and then you've got cracks across my teeth. So it's you you taking you into a real fight kickboxing, really, basically. And then it's a shame, really, at the time there was no UCF, which if I was a kid at 16, 14, 15, 16, I'd, I'd love to have done UCF because I, I think that is the ultimate sport, basically. You know, I think that is like, that is, if you're going to be a fighter, that's the one, UCF. So did you have any fears? During the martial arts? Yeah, you don't want to lose, do you? <laughs> <laughs> That's the only fear you've got. You don't want to lose, you know. It's really horrible because you have a bad habit and I've got a good friend of mine sitting out there at the moment and you wrap up and people have got nerves. Oh, they can't sleep. Mom was going and want to have a pee just before the fight. So you're all wrapped up and saying, oh, I've got to have a pee. <laughs> you think, what? <laughs> you've you got, you got your gloves on and all that and you can't have a pee. But, um, yeah, it was... Um, I'm glad I've done it, you know, it's, it's saved my life in the prison systems, saved my life when I had people jumping on my head, you know, attacking, take the chin, you know, so really basically I've had, uh, if I didn't do martial arts, I think I might could have been dead, you know, and especially when some of the prison situations I was in. Yeah. I mean, lot, you know, we're talking about George Floyd, how he had, um, he'd been locked up for nine minutes. Mm. I mean, the way they, prison systems, they actually show you how the prison staff grow, grab someone around the neck in an headlock and take them down the block. Yeah. You know, that's all got to stop. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I'm pleased God it does stop. You know, thank God it's all getting noticed now. All right. So you said, you know, you're selling people this important message. If they're tempted to get into things, the gangster lifestyle, they've got gangster writers, get into martial arts, get into boxing. I'm all about that. You did that yourself as a young person. You were on the streets, things were happening. You channeled your energy into the martial arts. But then... You went into bigger crimes. What yeah. was that decision-making process? Well, money, wasn't it? It's like again, uh, money. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, once you do something, it's like writing a book or writing. You pick a pen up and you use how to lose the pen. It's like an armed robbery. It's like doing the same thing because so, armed robberies are basically the same little bit alter here, little bit alter there. But once you get into it, it's hard to get out of it, Sean. Yeah. And then, uh, obviously, I've done two levy, lengthy prison sentences for uh, armed robberies. So, like, you know, um, and I've, they even tried to nick me eight years ago for this, so I was dressed as police. Yeah. You know, so um, so it's a really challenging thing to walk away from armed robberies, basically, because if you do it so many times, you know, and you, you hit bad times, you think, well, I'm, I could easily go back to what, I like doing so you've got to be strong enough to sort of say no I'm not going to do that yeah you know and, it, and it's hard work you know sometimes you know. being in a lifestyle myself you surround yourself with the same people this is what I noticed and then it gets a momentum of its own you don't even notice you're getting deeper and deeper and deeper did you think that that played an effect on you friends got today all like sort of Really good friends, you know. I pick my friends very closely. Yeah. I mean, like back in the olden days where you commit crime, we all had one target in mind, just getting a few quid. Yeah. But then you, I found that friends are golden. You know, you got your two friends or your three friends or ten friends, and they're golden. You know, you you put a thousand pound on the table, go with your friendship or you a thousand pound. You pick the friendship every time because yeah. I've been through, lost so many friends through grassing, being killed, being shot, suicide. You know, so. 
friends are close, you know. You got it's good to find good friends, you know. Yeah, I've got a few of those. Like wow, man. You became known as the Sledgehammer Gang. Could you explain what that means, please? What happened? We was um, when I was a kid, we started off at about sixteen, and we used to have the old Parker's coats with the fur rounds. You remember? Yeah. And we started off like doing. I was doing jeweler windows like with ball bearings because like what happens when say that's the window. In the time you used to have a stripe across it in the olden days, and you could fire by a bearing like a gun, and it go straight through the window. As long as you didn't hit the silver strips, you used to come up with the old, you know, the, what you get out of the dry cleaners, thing, go and pick out all the jewelry through the window. Yeah. So then we stepped, and then obviously where all jeweler windows were getting done, I was looking for kids doing that, and then mm -hmm. we moved into. By the time I was sixteen, nearly seventeen, we started doing. A building size, you know, anything like, and in the olden days, it was like, imagine your toolboxes today, it wasn't like tools or things like that. So it was quite easy to do, and it just slipped into, it was on a regular basis, but trouble was, they know the same people committing the same things, and at my, t at my age, there wasn't cameras, so it was quite easy to get away with, you know what I mean, Sean? Yeah. And then as we get older, obviously, the robberies get more bigger and bigger and daring and daring, you know, and that, that's how it goes on. And that's how you end up yourself getting serious lumps of bird. Yeah. yeah. And it got to the point where you end up taking a policeman hostage. How did that come about? Well, what happened, um, we just had a good bit of work, which was, and the people I was working with, they said, look, let's have a break because we'd been, we really had a really good run. And someone said to me, it was a van. So they wanted the van. And I jumped on another team, which was the wrong thing. And then they cancelled the van. They said that I've been firing shots and I think their arsehole fell out a bit. <laughs> and they give me a, a so, they, so this fella said, look, it's an easy man. He's got to wrap up a few people and just put them, um, just put them down type of thing. But they, the person I was actually working with, and I swear my children's life, all, all my kids get cancer, he wasn't the person I got to work with. So it was the biggest mistake in my world. I stepped out of my comfort zone with the people I work with, and I ended up with a, a knob, basically. Yeah. And uh, he got me next, basically, where he's calling out my first name and things like that. So, but let's see what they are. But um, yeah, like it turned out a bit nasty, basically. You know, like three hostages, policemen shoot out of police. You had know, all the, you know, the old the old lot, basically. You know, so yeah, it weren't it weren't. A, I ended up getting 18 years. So there was a point where you were like hiding in the mud kind of thing. Yeah, what happened with, um, my mate actually got shot. I was, was wrestling and um, he'd been shot. And um, so what happened, I didn't know he'd been shot. And obviously a club owner had been shot three times and all. And um, all I could see was someone staggering about. So I picked him up and obviously carried him and was high up in a building about nine stories, so I had to carry him all the way down because the blood was spurting. As he had his fingers, the blood was spurting through his fingers, so I knew we didn't have long. It was like obviously connected an artery. So I carried him down the stairs, got him outside, and obviously when I tried to, obviously about 10 police, maybe more, so I told him I'll go back, and then uh, they'll sort of walk back. So I carried him further, and they'll sort of, cars pulled up and made all the cars go back again. So I, so I got two guns, so I made the police cars go back. And um, obviously I took a left, then a policeman, I suppose he thought he was a bit of a hero, sort of tried to jump on me and I took him hostage basically. Got got him to get my mate in the car and then obviously away we went, you know, and it just started from now. It was just like from one, an easy robbery turned out to be mayhem basically. And the police started to follow that car, so how did you stop them from following the car? Uh, well, I put a gun in his head. And said, so I'm going to blow his brains out. Obviously, the policeman. And then, because um, we hit a bump, the gun went off. Because when you, when you, when a. <laughs> yeah, bump and the gun went off. Uh, there's bumps in the road. <laughs> and it bang and it blew <laughs> the window out. So um, the cop really think I've just missed his head in purpose, but he didn't. It literally missed his. I ain't joking. It must have gone past. Where it was from there to there, that was 30 wreck to like. That's how close I was to a 30 recommendation. <sighs> and it, as it went, went bang. And it sort of blew the window out, and then um, so the, obviously the pop, like the copper now thinks like fucking this hell, is this is real. This is yeah. And he turned out like I said on the last program, like what's his name? 
famous driver. Fuck, he's the best driver I've ever had after that. And he was doing like serious time, he was going through this and going through that. And then, and then um, so was he able to tell the other cops get stop following us? So yeah, that no, went down. To, no, that was I told him to do that. Yeah. So I said to him, tell him to back off. Yeah. Which he did. He said some all, all units backed off. In the back window, I could see they was all backing off. Yeah. And um, so it went back. So I thought, oh, we're, we're away, basically. Mm -hmm. So I thought I'd wrap him up, chuck him in the back of a boat and just shoot off. But obviously it wasn't. It was like, a, he didn't have a boat. So that was that was the fucking problem we had. So I got him Jesus. out and I got him to come out, got him out, got him to carry my mate out of the car. Obviously the blood was all over the copper. So he, he was smothered in blood. So we went, so I got him to cover and I was all we're sort of, we're, there's not a policeman in sight, you know, there's not, a, we, we got away basically, but they were, but because he was critically injured, I mean, I, if I don't get him somewhere safe, he's going to die, the fella with me. So, um, so I'm thinking, fucking, what the fuck's going on? So I got him, got the copper, took him to the door. I said to the copper, uh, put a gun in the back of his back. I said, tell the person who opens the door, I want his car. So obviously the, the, the cop is like, no, he just stood there. So I've got a gun in the policeman's back and the policeman, and a, an Irishman undoes the door. So he says to him, um, can I have your car keys? So the Irishman goes, typical Irishman, what, what do you want me Irish, what do you want me, what do you want me keys for? So I think you fucking div, you know, so I said, so tell me want the car keys. So anyway, so the cop says, I want your car keys. So he's going, what do you want my car keys? I said, go and get the fucking car keys. So he's like, where are me standing now? So he goes into the house, gets his car keys up. He says, going to bring me car back, aren't you? And all of a sudden I heard some voices. So I said to him, uh, so I don't know, he's got his underpants on this Irish one, do I? So I went, come on, you're coming along. So he went, what? I said, you're coming along. Because now his family has seen it. So I said, don't ring the police. It'd be all right. So anyway, gets him, picks my mate up puts him in a car and uh and they were away again you know so obviously it's something like a joke i've got an irishman a policeman myself and a quickly shot man you know so uh then we're going down the road and all of a sudden obviously they must have rung his wife or something said look my old, my old man's just taken hostage so then um all of a sudden a police car appears from nowhere so then another police car appears from nowhere so I'm thinking, what the fuck's going on here? So we're, in, we're getting driving faster and faster and faster, picking up more police cars. Then all of a sudden, I, I've got about eight or police cars. So we smashed into a, it's took some odd geezer behind me. I didn't know where I was. So he's going left, right, left, right, because I'm trying to get into a safe house. And we smashed into a wall. And then obviously the copper jumped out. So I, he's no good now because he's, he's the driver. I was only using the policeman as a, a driver. And then obviously to keep the police off my back. So I looked up and I see some more police cars. All of my statements, you can see, I'm not bullshitting. So I thought, right, I'll get another police car. So I chased after another police car. So and then he's reversing back. So I let a few shots go. So then that was it. I had about three police cars reversing back up the road. And the faster I was running, the faster I was reversing. <laughs> so I tur turn around. I think, fuck me, how can I get another police car? And all of a sudden, some... Some 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 tiddlywink turned up like a Chinaman with his bird. So I'm not going to take a bird hostage. I was trying to think, you know, fuck, I don't want to take a bird hostage. And um, so I run back, got me mate again, chucked him in the back back of a car, another car. So the Chinaman, I said, right, get in the car. So the Chinaman's going to look at me and going, what? I said, get in the fucking car. So I get him in the car. All of a sudden, some birds starting to get in the motor. So I've got my foot and I'm pushing him out of the motor and I'm thinking, please, don't fucking get out of the motor. So if she wants to get in the motor, I've got a gun in my hands, I've got a boyfriend, and I've got, he's bleeding badly and his bird's trying to get in the car. So I'm trying to push him out of the car. Anyway, so eventually we take off and we're away. But by that time, I mean, there must have been 10, 15, 20 police vehicles behind us then. So I'm thinking, how the fuck am I going to get rid of get rid of the old bill? I'm going to drop this fella off who's with me, like, you know. So we kept on going. And going, and but what I did, I kept throwing the door open, so I didn't know where he was getting out. So all of a sudden, he got to the house he wanted to do. He runs into the house. So I looked round. I thought I can't run in the house with him because obviously I got about twenty police cars behind me, and I could see all the they're moving up with the guns and things like that, you know. So it's, it's, so I'm thinking to myself, what the fuck am I going to do? So I drops him off, slams the door, 
we're off again. But also, there's just me and the Chinaman now, so we keep on driving. And then uh, um, I'm looking and I'm thinking, like the back, I can see all the lights and I can see the Range Rovers moving up. I, can see, I know where the arms, I'm not stupid because I've, I've been in situations which I can't talk about with confrontations with police before and on, on robberies before, which we've dealt with before. And um, so I know where it's going. So all of a sudden, like, and I see, I knew I was driving down the road, but as I was driving down the road, I kept throwing the door open, throwing the door open. So I didn't know where he got out. So when he was safe, I knew I was safe. That was about, that went on for about 20 minutes, half hour. And by that time, they obviously got, they, I couldn't get out of the road. So he took me out to a place called Abridge. And I couldn't get off the road because they're like, just, how can you explain that? Like, just these roads, you get in country roads, which you don't get roads going off here and left. So, um, so I see a load of headlights up front and I knew I was going to hit, hit a roadblock. So I said to the geese, when I say stop, stop. So anyway, so um, all of a sudden I said stop. So the chime stops. So I'm out of the car, bang. So I'm running across the, um, so I start running across some kind of field, but at the time I didn't know. It's a potato field. So I'm thinking I'm gonna make my way, get out there, get in, get in another car, and I'll get away. But what I don't know, they come round the back by me getting in my way has now cost me my life basically because I picked up like twenty, forty. You know, there's, oh, there's vehicles, coppers everywhere. You know what I mean? So, so I know me getting in my way. If I'd have just got dropped him off or I got on my own way, I'd have got out of it. I wouldn't be here today, you know, I wouldn't be never talking about it. But I'm there caught, I've, I'm fucked, I've got old built everywhere. So I hit the field, and obviously when I've hit the field, I started running across the field, and um, I tried to get into an house, all of a sudden the door, the geese managed to get the door, and I carry on running. And then um, I remember like, I was see all these white shirts and black, black vests, jumping out of the vehicles and I could see what they had guns on it. So I thought myself, I've got to get a bit of grain on. But I didn't shoot at them. I wasn't shooting at the police. So I went bang, bang over the edge. I let two go. And I, um, obviously that I didn't realise that's what saved my life. Because when I was chasing me in the fields, then all of a sudden I went Phew! And it's really weird. When when you hear a bullet coming discharging, you see a flash, then you hear th that's what you hear, like is that th that's what he goes past your head, you know. He's like, <laughs> so anyway, so I've heard, oh, fuck me, they're firing back. Never mention them in the fucking statements, you know, like, because they, 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 they want to fucking iron me out, you know. So, um, this is what, this is what to this day, you know, what a cover up was in the 70s. So, um, as I run, I, f I went into the mud, I sort of fell into the mud, and um, I looked up and I thought, oh no, look, I could see them all running across there, running. So I dug myself in, Sean, you know, so, um, so I thought, so if I cover myself right up, so what I did, I done all the muds. I put all the mud all over me and all that, So I, and I got some plants, put up the up all that, and obviously I've got, I've got two guns, so I think, so what the fuck, I'm gonna, you know, so I'm sitting there, so I thought, what do I do? I want time to think, but because there's so many police there, I've got police over to the left, I've got people to the right, I've got people behind me, I know I'm now trapped, you imagine being in a field, a football field, you've got, Team there, you got a team there, a team behind me, and a team over the back. So I'm thinking, where, where am I going to get out of this type of thing? You know, so uh, so I laid there, and I thought to myself, they'll calm down. They think I've gone, but obviously they knew I was in there somewhere. So uh, oh, sorry, I got cramp on my leg then. So um, so I thought, what do I, I lay in the field anyway? I was laying in the field. I'm covered in mud, and, I, and about an hour, two hours go by, and then I can hear them coming through. But we're lucky for me when when they run into the field. It was all like imagine I if I, if it was just me in the field, it'd have been one footprint, wouldn't it? So then they'd have followed me where I was in the hole, found out where I was in the hole. This is where I'm telling the truth, right? They'd have known I was in the hole, wouldn't they? But when when the police was running after me, because I fired at them, the footprints everywhere they run. So they where basically they was that not far behind me. If there were so many footprints, they couldn't tell where I was. So that saved my life, basically. If I don't discharge them fire, firearms over their head, they'd have followed me the footprints and found me in the hole and probably shot me dead. So um, I fit myself, fuck. So after about two hours, it was like a light rain, 
and I could and I, I could hear them coming through. Do you know what I mean? I could hear them coming through with the guns, and then I could at the corner of my eye I could see a dog hand who was about I'd say about thirty foot away, twenty foot away, and I think they're going to pick up the, they're going to pick up on the smell or whatever. But unbeknown to me, we had a boiler suit on, I was smothered in mud, and it raining. So obviously the mud and the rain was covering me odours or whatever I had on. And, and obviously the dog was sniffing over to the left hand side, and I, and, I, and as I was laying there, this, this all of a sudden I could feel a shadow coming up behind me, sort of like sort of because I was laying that way, and as I was laying like that, I thought to myself he's going to tread on me in a minute. So as he's come up, he's following the footprints, and I remember he's got the gun like that, and he's looking like that, and I can literally see his face looking like that. But I've got that like that. And if you've been in that situation in your life, Sean, where he's got 40 of his mates, they're going to kill me. Or if I'm going to shoot him, or is he going to shoot me? Now, that split moment, that split second is go, do I fire because I think he's going to shoot me? Or, sit, or do I sit there? Now, in your life, martial arts, everything you've done in your life, that split second could have got me 30 years for the rest of my life I wouldn't be out because I would have shot the copper or he could have killed me so that situation in your life is probably a situation in your life you're never going to come across normal people so all of a sudden he just walked off and I thought fuck it you know I mean that was like and I was thinking like you could and you could feel the heart go, my heart's going now just listening to this you could feel and you think and all of a sudden he went off and I've watched them all go through then I was going, oh, she'll shout, and no, he's not in here, no, he's not here, he's not in here. So I thought, oh, fuck it, they're fucked off, right? So I laid there again. But another three hours later, they come through again. This is about five in the morning. I'm thinking, they're going to find me this time. Exactly the same thing, but this time he hasn't come up next to me. He's gone past. They've gone past me by about four foot, just walked past, going through, just walking through. So as the daylight come, it was about... I'll get to about 10 o'clock. This is free. I'm in there from about 4 o'clock in the morning to about 10 o'clock the next day. So I was laying there and I thought, I moved. I don't know why I was getting a thing called hypothermia because where the water got into my system and the mud, I started shaking. So when you're shaking, it's really hard. It's really, unless you've been caught like that, and there's nothing you can do. How big you are, how tough you are, you're like that, shaking. But what happened? Well, I was shaking. I could see the mud coming off my shoes. So what happened? I thought, oh, no, no. I could see one of my foot come out type of thing. I thought, if they come through in the day, they're definitely going to see my foot hanging out and I've got no chance this time. So to the right of me, was a load of weeds, like like weeds and plants and trees. And I thought, well, if I crawl to there, I'll get in, dig myself in. But unbeknown to me, they've got binoculars, they've got, I mean, they've got old bill everywhere, these ice scope things there. So I come out, I sort of come out about, about an hour later, about half past 11, I think it was, I started crawling. And as I was crawling, I, at the corner of my eye, I could see a lot of movement. And I thought to myself, fuck. Then I see a load more movements. But unbeknown to me, what, what they've done, they've got, someone's caught me moving. Like, you know, when you're sort of going along the group. So I've got about 200 yards. I'm just about 20 foot away from the thing and also I see them all running so I knew and I, just, I thought they were going to do me so I stood up but where you've been laying there the things that so I stood up smothered in mud and it was like a load of kids like, oh we got him you know running around and all that and uh, I thought fucking hell but I got him away the other fella who, 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 who got me nicked from the start to the beginning and then I, and I and the message back was we fucking told you you know what are you doing you know we had some lovely bits of work what the fuck are you doing going out doing that you know I was warned and that's what I said with young, young kids they don't listen to the older generation I wish to God I did through my life you know because young kids you can't be told what to do so we get back to the story so anyway they get they put me in a in a police van they take me to uh, the police station the coppers all like come in I've got some commander come in to me he goes oh, I can't believe you was in there for that long another hour and a half he was, we, would, we was going you know, you've got some arsehole son being in there and like, give me all that G, trying to talk to me. So I went, yeah, 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 yeah. So I thought, how the fuck can I get out of here? And I don't know why, I just think, I'm not, I'm not going to have this. So they, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm sitting in this cell and a big Indian type geezer come in. So he sat down, he said to me, I said, uh, I 
thought, what the fuck? They put me in it, put him in with me, this geezer for, like, you know. He goes, I said, what are you in for? He said, I reckon I'm in for touching up little girls. <sighs> so I thought, this is, this is fucking real. Like, I've just been dead all this. So I went, really? As he sat down, like, I just booted him straight in the head. So like, as he, he sort of went back like that, I went bang, 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 and old, old Bill steamed in, grabbed hold of me, took me out. So they want to get me out. They want to get me now. They nicked me. They want to get me out, get me out the police station. So they put me in a, a vehicle, like an armoured vehicle. But at the time, it was similar to this, the woods. And you got like metal down it and all that. So I was handcuffed. So what happened? They put the three covers in the front, handcuffed me to the side of the van, like that. So I'm handcuffed to the van. So imagine this now, I've got an handcuff stuck like that. But I'm on this side. So I'm thinking like that. So I don't know what at the time I was doing like 150 key for six reps, like I was doing just under 180 bench. So I'm sitting there, and at the time they had these racket ratchet cubs. R ratchet cubs are different because they know people get out of them and they'd like a ratchet. And where I had the ratchet, I was sitting, I was sitting in the front, and I was sitting like that, and I just went, and, it, and I heard ting, and I thought, fuck, and I heard it go bang. But now I'm, I'm, I'm in a controlled unit, smothered with this wet iron mesh type of thing, and I think, how, how am I going to get out of here? So I, I couldn't move, so I was just sat there, and a couple looked like that, sort of say, like, what was that noise? And like, you know, because we don't forget they're big old vans and they make a lot of noise. And I sort of still sat there and I thought, so they don't know it's come off. So I thought, fuck. So I waited till we could put his graves in his road or something like that was called. So I got up, fucking rips, got the van, the side of the van, I went, rip. And it come off. It come off, you know. And I thought, wow. And the three coppers sitting in the front sort of look around like that, sort of say, what the fuck? So I've ripped the side of the van off, all the, all the wire mesh, and this is where martial arts come in, Paul, and there was a window like that, like there's sealed windows. There's a thing called a My Gary front kick. So I stood up and went, smash. And the windows come out, flipped out type of thing, on, come out, I got the thing out. But now my size has worked against me because the old's quite not big type of thing. So I got went to get through the window, but I was just a little bit too big. So this cop has jumped around the sides, so I managed to grab hold of his uniform like that. So imagine he's got his jackets on. Like that. So I got him like that. And he's, he's screaming like fucking talk. Ah, he's coming out. So another one come. So I managed to get that arm out, grabbed him. So they're trying to grab hold of me. But with them doing me a favour, where they're struggling with me, I'm struggling. And they're, they're not pushing me backwards. They're struggling to try and get me off them. And they're pulling me out of the van. So another one's coming. So I'm still coming out of the van. And so I just felt this fucking gun at the side of me. And they went... You move, we'll blow your fucking head off. And I went, so what can you do? So the dirty cunts, right, after all that fucking getting out like that, I think they're going to pick me up, which should have been easier. Walk me around the car and put me that didn't. They fed me back through the van, laid on me in the fucking van. I got three coppers, about five coppers all laying on me in the van and got me to the nearest police station. So gets me in there, so it takes me to the police, it gets me to the prison. So they went, right, him, straight in there. So straight, I'm on patches, which is a yellow stripe. Great big yellow stripe. I'm double A catted up. And I thought, all right, so the geezers who I'm working with, they went, what the fuck? It's all over the news, shoot out of police, fucking hostages, all that. So the geezers send messages for me, what the fuck? I said, I want out. I want out. I said, I want out. I want out of the system. But the system they put me in was Bet Brixton D Seg, was the most secure unit in England. No one's ever escaped from there at the time, from the yard. So I, man I managed to get a bug in. There was a bug, we got a bug in. And then I said, look, I had they all set up. And then they tried to get me out of there. So I, I come out, we went to, the only time you come out of there was like a church. The only time double A cats could come out of out the cage was to go to church, RC church. So this is about four, month, four weeks later. So my mate said, right, we're going to get him out. So because they're all thinking, what the fuck? I want to stop because, you know, you're in that rage. I want to get out. You know, I ain't stopped trying to get away. I try to get out of that, try to get out of the van. I thought, fuck it, no, no unit's going to hold me. You know what I mean? I'm going to get out of there. And uh, so cut a long story short, the only time we come out, I looked up, we, we planned it, plotted it. And, uh, um, and it, it, unlucky for me, it went wrong. You know, they had the, they had the lorry there, they had the ladders there, they had everything there. Like, and it's just the signals got done. And like, like obviously, um, I come out to the church if you want to hear the story, Sean, what happened. Absolutely, now. we've got as much time as, as possible. Yeah, go for it. Anyway, so they lock us up. There's, the only ones in the unit it was me and the IRA and a couple of East, Le East London armed robbers, basically, who was in there. And um, out of 10, 
10 people, there's probably eight Irish and two Englishmen, me and another fella. So he goes out to the church. Now it's all plotted up to come. There's a reception at the bottom. There's the cage we was in. There's a church there. So I've got to get to the church to go and pray. But I know I've got to get down there, past reception, round the back, and there's like there's this alleyway you can get into where the, between the fence and the wall, right? So I thought myself, oh, I've got to fucking do this. So we plot it up, done it. Anyway, so the day comes. I said, right, church, imagine like, you know, all, and every time when the church is about five, six screws with your dog handlers and everything walking you from the seg from our unit to, to the church, the guardia. But there's this screw that I fucking hated him, I did. He was like, right, yeah, he used to have a leather glove on with one cut out and that was his trigger thing. You know, one of those fuckers, right? And that day, I thought, yeah, what a day for him to turn up. This geezer walking us to the church, like, you know, so uh, so I've got the dog handlers all walking. So anyway, do you imagine the atmosphere? You're waiting there and you're thinking, I hope my mates are out. So now, don't forget, I've done tons of work with these people. They ain't let me down. I know we're going to be there, right? Anyway, cut a long story short. I looked at the pen. So I looked up as we come out of the unit. I looked up to the window, which my mate sent the signal, sort of say, look, he's out, meaning I'm out of the unit. So also, and I just thought, fuck it, I know they're going to be there. And the screw who's there, the one with the leather glove, I just went, crack. So his sort of legs gone, like that type of thing. Boom, right out. He's, he's, I've knocked him, spark out him. He's proper gone. He's. All of a sudden, as I'm running, I could hear, get him, get him, get him, get him, get him. But at the time, I knew that was going to happen, so I had a coat with me. So I wrapped around the coat around my arm. And as I kept running, like, I turned, and all of a sudden, a dog jumped, so it went straight into the coat where I knew it was going to go anyway. And I caught it with this, they called like inside of CLK, and it caught it right in the throat. And, it's, and what a kick it was, and all because the dog went up in the air like that. And I went, shh, kick that in the head. And that run, he went, Rrr, fucked off, right? So I got between the fence to the wall. All of a sudden, flares come over, so I know they're there. So the flares hit the wall and bounced off the wall. The wall's going up like that. So all the screws are right, Bill. So you imagine how many screws in bricks and DCG at the time. So they're coming from everywhere. So, but they've come down, flares come off, they miss the signals and they've gone, right? So it's all on Jed Avenue, you've seen it. Now I've got a problem. I've got about 30 screws that side, 40 screws that side. I mean, a bit of a bit of a pickle like that, like sort of a. It's like, um, you know, we just go down the side of the prison sort of thing. So it's, it's like Zulu, right? So I'm on that side, that side, me in the middle, right? So I've got patches on. I've got all the kids out there and they go, leave me alone, fucking leave me alone, you cunts and all that. So I stood there and I thought, he's going to me, the main one's going, get on the floor. And I could see the hand going, get on the floor. But where you're hyped up and that, you know, and you're thinking, fuck it, I ain't, I ain't going to, uh, I ain't laying down here. So I thought, well, the boys want to see a show? They're going to see a show, right? So the screws all stood, all looking at me like that. So I started running them like that, right? And you can see their faces go, what are you, what's the fuck's he doing? And I just flew in and went, smash, bang. And that was it. Oh, mate, crash, smash, bang. Kick him in the fucking head, kick, kick him all over the gaff. I fought back, anyway, just smashed up to bits. Anyway, I'm just, they're called chicken. They're chicken you up like that. And what happens, lucky for that, like I said, martial arts, you know how to break them blocks. So anyway, they got me. Takes me into the unit. They take me into the seg. It's like a strong box. So they got me. So they got me round the neck and everything like that, right? So, and they try to stamp on my face, kicking me in the head and everything like that. So I'm, everything's going bang, bang, bang. Take you know like through that, through that. You know, dropping it down the head locks and that. So, what I said, martial arts saved my fucking life, John. You know what I mean? So they try to kick me in the bollocks. You drop your legs, you know, and just and you just you lock, they're locked up like that. Anyway, so the governor walks in, got goes to him. We can't have him in here, meaning the block. He's got to go back to where I was. And there was a cage. There was like a cage like like, like this, not much bigger, and it was a cage. I ended up in there for six months. So after the penthouse, I got to try to get out of the van, which I've got two year concurrence for that, for trying to get off the van. I tried to get out of bricks and I spent six months in a cage for that. So, you know, that, that's just, it's just to get a geezer away who I weren't even supposed to be with. And that's why I say principles to me. I've got to tell the story because what happens, the old school principles, you don't leave your mate on a bit of work. Another geezer, and the bit what hurt me most out of it all, that geezer's out for two years. He goes and gets nicked for something else. They find him on his blood two years later. Never give my woman 10 pence. So you talk about principles. I lost my life for a plum, basically. You know, and I was warned not to do it. And I, I went and done it, you know. So but getting back to the, 
crime, it wasn't something I was supposed to be because we do vans, we've done banks, we've done sorting offices. I've been nicked from them all. all they're like vans, banks, sorting offices. That was something I weren't supposed to be on, Sean. My own fucking fault. I was told not to do it and I've done it because I was bored. Fucking Sunday night, fucking Saturday night, boss. And, 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 that's, and that's what happens with armed robberies. You know, you can you, you have a lovely bit of work, you can get a nice few stopping vans and bits and pieces. And then because you're a greedy bastard and, you, and you're bored and you want a bit of excitement, and that's how I'm myself, getting myself into that trouble over that. And it just catapulted into that. And it, we went into prisons and then it was like, fighting your way all through the prisons, you're a double A cat, you're not going to get nothing. It just didn't stop, you know, for like, this went on for like 10, started, it went on 10 years, two weeks of mission, basically. From that moment, my life changed. So the way Danny Dyer portrayed it then was that the club owner was at gunpoint and it went wrong because the club owner gra tried to grab the yeah, gun yeah, and then the bullet went off. Yeah. And it was that bullet that went through your crime partner. And it yeah, hit, hit the club owner as it well. Wasn't, wasn't me put that way. Yeah, so, yeah. so um, the China man was it a China man that was um, yeah, on, on the they, Danny Dyer episode as well? They, there was a police. There was a there was a man shot three times. The policeman was taken hostage. An Irishman was taken hostage. Then a Chinaman was taken hostage, and then obviously all that kicked off after. You know, so really, basically, it's a sore point. You know, you, and when you come on shows like yourself, I'm here to talk about other things. Basically, Sean, I want to talk yeah. about. We've moved on like 30 years. Yeah. So now all I'm here is to say to kids, really, I'm here to try and help kids. I'm not here to big myself up at all. And then people sit there, all the tea cut, you know, all the warriors at home going, he's a wanker, he's all that. Yeah. You know, I know, I know I'm know, i going to get some of that shit. Before we get to the prison stuff then, the prison stories, what I want to do then is in, in this first half is talk about the film production that you've got going on because... All the people who just watched that story. I mean, that was one of the best stories that's ever been told on this channel. I mean, my heart was oh, going thanks, like mate. crazy. Thanks, it was just nonstop action. You told it so well. And people watching this are probably thinking they could see that on the big screen, you know. So I'm just going to, I'm going to read, am I okay to read the thing you sent to me? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to read this and um, we'll, we'll tell people how they can get involved. And there's yeah. going to be a link below this video yeah, thank you. if they want to get involved. So Vic sent me this in the last couple of days, and um, it's called Vic Dark, Making of a Money Getter, created by Ben Cookson, a six-part true crime series set in London's 1970s and 80s underworld. In 1972, London's Metropolitan Police dealt with an annual total of 380 armed robberies. By 1978... This figure had increased to 734. By 1982, this number had more than doubled to 1,772, a 366% increase in a decade, amounting to more than five armed robberies each and every day in the UK's capital city alone. This was the golden era of armed robbery, and Vic Dark was at the forefront of a violent epidemic. But this new breed of criminal didn't consider themselves to be gangsters. They were better than that. They were money getters. There's a difference between a gangster and a money getter. Gangsters are bullies who enjoy hurting people and do it for kicks and status. Money getters do what's needed to be done to make a pound note. That's the way of the old school. Vic Dark, making of a money getter, is a scripted, six-part true crime drama based on the real-life story of an ex-armed robber. It tells the story of how a Bruce Lee and karate-loving 13-year-old boy from London's East End graduates from petty theft to major bank heists, including armoured money trucks and tiger kidnappings. And how, on one rainy... Saturday night in September 1988, age 30, Vic comes to have a 38 revolver pressed against the head of a policeman, forcing him to drive a stolen marked car while his accomplice on a heist gone wrong lies bleeding to death on the back seat from a gunshot wound. A watershed criminal event that revolutionised the British police's response to armed robbery. 
With unique access to Vic Dark himself, we are able to paint in graphic detail and frightening realism the life of one of the UK's most notorious money getters. We could take an audience on the extreme highs and lows of what it means to risk everything for high rewards and into a hidden underworld where calculated violence is a lucrative skill set and each and every bit of work could be your last. Now, that's just a blurb from that. And I looked at um, the actors that are involved. I've just watched a series on Netflix called White Lines. So I'm sure some of you watching this have watched White Lines on Netflix. Um, old school rave stuff and party scene. A young man, DJ from Manchester gets killed. His sister goes out there looking to, to find out what's going on with the murderers. So that's the, that's the main actor. Um, that's going to be playing you. So congratulations, yeah. Vic, on getting we, it to we this level. We haven't got it signed up yet, but okay. we're hoping to. We're hoping to get it signed up, yeah. Okay. That's, that's the approach to him, yeah, so we're hoping to. What is with, with what we did, we took it from... Um, have you ever seen a film called Heat? Robert so, De Niro? Yeah. Oh, I love it, yeah. Yeah, well, sh sh our life story really bases, based on Heat and a film called Town, Ben Affleck. Not seen that one. Yeah, you watch Town, it's the same. But what it is about, an East End kid grows up in the East End. It's like Once Upon a Time, America, Heat, all put into one. And how we grew up when we was kids, how we turned into armed robbers and we went on to commit armed robberies. And like I said, sticking to the old school rules. You know, we wasn't... Uh, it's hard to say because... You know, if you swore in front of your mum, you get a smack around the edge. You know, we're not, we're not like into hurting people or things. It's just that I grew up that way. It's like on when we was on armed robberies and things like that. Martial arts, instead of shooting someone or hurting someone, you could just go boom, put them down, or you know, just drop them. You know, like sweep their legs or something. So really, basically, we was there to just take money, Sean, and not hurt anyone. So, and that, that's where it comes in that. Some people graphified it where you want to go out and hurt someone for something. We're not like that. I don't want to go and hurt anyone. Do you know what I mean? I'm not being funny. It's like kids today. They, they, two kids want to fight each other. Two kids want to edge each other on to fight each other. But in my way, I'd say to them, look, give that kid a way out so he can escape. You know, so he don't have to look lose face. And that's what happens with today. You haven't got older people trying to sort people's problems out, you know. It's like the East End equivalent of the old school mafia code because I wrote the life story of a Bonanno um, associate who, who whacked a lot of people and he said, you know, it was all about not harming women, not harming kids. It's crimes of integrity. That's, how, that's the expression he used. Yeah. 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 But uh, like I say, with, with, with us, if we had to cross over, it's an easy thing to do. But, you know, we're not like that. You know, a lot, a lot of people... Um, they're probably sitting there watching it and thinking, oh, he's a cunt, is this and that, and I can understand them thinking that, and I deserve what I get, I need to be banged up and that. But we're the most nicest people like you can find. You know, we're out the granny across the road. You know, we're out the working class people. So that's where we're lost. The kids are lost today. And this is where we're going. You know, that's why I do, I'm coming to do a programme today, not just beat my chest to say how big I am. We're here to try and sort of, obviously I'm here to pump my film up, obviously, in my six-part series. But like I say, if we can help any kids or do anything, like we, we, me and you are going to go through things in a minute with the prison systems, and we can get round to help the prison systems, you know, and things like that. Someone like myself, if the government took two minutes out to sit down with people like myself, we could cause and save so much upset and people killing themselves in prisons and things like that. I'm not here to stick up for prisoners, but also like to see prisoners' rights. I'm worried about people getting evicted from their houses, about poverty of children. Do you know I mean? what's going on about the blacks and the whites, where they should get the black kids and make, put them into education, get them into colleges and make them MPs. Even out, it's the only way they're going to beat them. You can't beat the system. You can be part of the system. So I'm putting the link in the description box below this video to what you sent me. Yeah. And that shows how people can become investors for this. Is there anything you'd like to say to the people watching this who perhaps are interested in becoming investors for this? Well, it's not actually me, Sean. It's a, it's a couple of people called Ben and, a, and, a, and a, 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 a fella called Mike and Rob. They're the ones who, who are doing it for me. They're, they're absolutely diamonds. I can't thank them enough. And obviously they made up companies and that, you know, these are businessmen who, who come along who link with the films and they've all got together and with their contacts and 
you know, like actually starting off to do a six part series is not as easy as you think it is. People go, I'm going to do a film, I'll do that. It's not. These people will take you through it. You've got to have a Bible. You've got to, spl- you've got to explain your stories. So people think, I'm going to write a film. People think, that took two years to get where it is, Sean. You know, it's not, not as easy as someone, and getting someone to take your story on and all. Is another, that's another hard bit, you know, to get people to actually have faith in you to go out there to make something. It's not about money. I swear my children, it's not that about my brothers and my It's not about money for my family. It's like a trilogy, you know. If we can get the old school back to say to these kids, look, stop fucking taking drugs and killing each other. Let's, let's try and sort it out, you know. That's what it's about. And if kids are watching this and when the schools reopen, can they contact you and you would talk to kids in schools? Well, it wouldn't be able to talk to me. I'm not going to lie. If it could come through to us, I'll get people to talk to them, but not me, basically. Yeah, no, yeah okay. No, no, because I'm sort of, uh, I'm out of that sort of thing. I hear you. Yeah. I hear you. So, like I said then, if you've watched this and you heard Vic just tell that story that's just needs to be on the big screen, there's a link in the description box below this video if you want to check out the status of where that is at. So when I read that, I stopped on Tiger. What was it? Tiger kidnappings or something. I can't remember what the expression was. Yeah. What What does that mean? You'd better ask the film people because I didn't write it. It's a, <laughs> the right theme people write that. You kidnapped the tiger? Or is that a, a crime expression? I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how it's, how it's come across. You're not a Tiger King. No, no. no. no I know the title. I've seen it. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite good. It's, it's quite good, the Tiger King. I watched it. Yeah. yeah it's good. Yeah, yeah. It's good. really is good. Yeah. You know. But like getting back to... Then we've got the crime stories out of the way and the, who you are and what you are. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I like to sort of, there's a few issues we like to talk about, like the prison system, mm-hmm. how I think we can stop. See, what happens today? Mm-hmm. Like, for me, the prison system, let's take the prison system as it is, right? You walk into a prison system, someone gets a serious big sentence and everyone goes, right, yeah, they killed someone. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, everyone's got to be punished. I can understand that, right? There's a way someone's going to be punished. But a lot of people don't understand, why do they keep the murder rate, as we would class it, or the suicide rate? You never see that in the papers. You never hear anyone killing themselves. You never hear about anyone chopping themselves up. So it comes under the secret, like their their law, right? Their law, they won't disclose that there's been five people stabbed, three people have killed themselves today, because we're not important. Con- cons are not important, right? But what I like to do is sort of get a thing. So we manage people who are coming out of jails. Now, you want to help people try and get them back into the system, right? So the only way you're going to do that is get up a program where they are trying to do it at the moment. So a kid comes into prison, he wants a job. He can't drive. And that's going to cost money. Get instructors, take him, teach him how to do driving. If he miss. If he if he fucks up, put him back in jail. But once that kid comes out and he's got a, a job, get he wants to be a driver. He's got a chance of being a driver. Try and help ex cons at the e- end of their sentences to get back into society because a lot of people who I know come out of prison. There's your ninety quid. Fuck off. You know, and 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 they wonder why you're going back in prison, Sean. So we're, I'm just saying to them, try and work out a program to help people to get back into the system. I'm getting back to suicide. This is very close to me. But I've lost 11 friends through suicide in prison, which is sad. I mean, like, some really good friends have killed themselves, and you can't, you never know the reason why they've killed themselves, right? So if you put a phone, some kind of little phone where they can talk to their family, go earn through privileges. I'm not asking them to do it. Earn through privileges. On that phone, you can talk to a screw, Samaritans. You can talk to one of his people at home if he gets his privilege. As long as that person who's 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 lonely, banged up 23 hours a day, like I've got people coming out of prison at the moment who we know, they're getting out for 10 minutes shower if they're lucky three, in every three days because of the virus. So they're using that virus, COVID-19, to bang everyone up, right? We fought for them tellies, burnouts, sit downs, smash ups, and all that, right? So that was the best thing that came into the prison system. But when you've been in prison and you hit depression, which we all have, I have, everyone has, 
you banged up 23 is despair. You need to speak to someone like a family member and keep them on. Because at the moment, people chopping themselves up in prison, it's gone through the roof. They don't show you that, Sean, do they? They are absolutely... And you. And when you see people mutilate themselves, how tough you are. I was in Parkhurst, and a fellow kept cutting his stomach open and ri 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 ripping out his intestines, literally like a bit of string, pulling them out like that. So I said, I said is this, is, and the screw went, don't worry about it, it does it all the time. And that's how it is in prison. That's how brutal prison is. Do you know what I mean? So getting back to the suicides and self-harming, people, medication, we need some kind of thing to sort of help the people to come out, which will help benefit society. Because these kids go into jobs. I've done it. You know, I'll turn my life around. You can do it. You can turn your life around. But you need some help to turn your life around. Just don't kick them out on the streets. Do you know what I mean? Like a lot of people go in there and they come out of different people. They can either come out very angry. You lock someone up in a... Like I, I was locked up for 10 years, two weeks. I never I never got parole, never applied for parole. I was a double A cat. I got released to Category A, which is the highest you can get. At that time, the word service, I got released to Category A. Now, I'm getting walked to a door to be released with 10 screws, two dog handlers to let me back in society, right? Now, if my brother wasn't a millionaire and didn't have friends to help me, I had £90 in my pocket. Where was I going? What was I doing? I've got no money. Do you see what I'm saying? So kids who are going to walk out them gates have got nothing. So we've got to make a foundation for them to try and say, right, let's try and get into college. Let's try and do something. Try and get them to do something. Do you know what I mean? To try and get a job. Because all they're going to do is go back to crime, what they know. Do you understand what I'm saying, Sean? I understand 100% what you're saying. I've been campaigning about this for years. So yeah, thanks, I've had thanks, politicians yeah. come to my talks in the schools and they, it creates an emotional reaction and they promised me the world and I never hear from them again. And where I was housed in Arizona, 90% were shooting up. And I understood why, because of the yeah. trauma they'd been through as kids, because of the stress of the system on them. There was no rehabilitation. It was just drug and gang infested mayhem. And they gave them $50 at the gate and said, have a nice day. Yeah. How the hell, you know, they spend that on some food and then they go back to crime and they're right back in. But here's the thing. Every time they got rearrested, $50,000 of taxpayers' money to the prison. Yeah. It's in their interest for them to come back. Yeah. Mm. And the politicians have got shares in these companies yeah. that are making bank off it. Yeah. They know, you know, this is like a self-perpetuating thing that they're profiting from. They throw away people, prisoners. I said to the guard, I said, how do you guys get away with the dead rats in the food, the cockroaches crawling over us at night? Guards murdering mentally ill prisoners. I've got videos of it on my channel. Guards murdering mentally ill prisoners. How, how, hardly even committed cr any crimes. How do you guys get away with it? The guard said, the public does not care about prisoners and the world has no idea what goes on in prisons. And it's true. That's why I started to write stuff down and, and expose what was going what? on. What made me take up um, the prison situation was I was in a I was in a in a unit and we was in a block and it was this man was six to eight years old his name was Ronnie Easterbrook he had one finger lost his finger and he's an hunger strike he was a bag of bones literally I mean when I say bag of bones say you're a normal person be twelve stone he'd be eight stone and then one day I was just a spy out of boredom I looked through my spy hole and I see this big Welsh screw come down and he got his plate. He went like that with his nose. And he put it on, on his geezer, the old man's food, like that. I went, you, I went, you fucking animal. This old man's about 67, right? And I looked and I went, is this fucking society? And you talk about humanity. And that old boy stood there. He started eating it. Yeah, <sighs> <sighs> so... Oh, yeah, man, it's terrible. And, you know, the media say things like, yeah, prisoners lock them up, throw away the key, they're all rapists, serial killers. And on the other side, they say, how easy they got it. They got PlayStations, they got gourmet food, they got luxuries. And that's what keeps the public hating on the prison population. They're all getting manipulated by the media. 
the politicians are making money off the back of it. And uh, another thing that I noticed in America that's responsible is the war on drugs because it's not all pedophiles, rapists, serial killers. The average arrest where I was housed is like a black kid or a Mexican kid with a little bit of weed. Get like a two to five year sentence. So a guy get a roach of weed, get a two year sentence. Yeah. That's how they fill the prisons up with low level drug users. Yeah. So I've written a series of books now campaigning against the war on drugs, calling for the war on drugs and drug laws to be reversed and for drugs to be criminalized controlled and young people to be educated and not incarcerated yeah see my anger when i see that i just went on a fucking wolf mate we, i burnt we burnt the prisons down feel it Vic. riots kicked off i was in units and you just and we should and these screws are supposed to be your friends i'll try and be friend with you and that just sends you on a spiral of hatred and you come out of that prison and you're fucking raging do you know what I mean? So what I'm trying to say to you, you've got to take that anger out of people because I had so much anger in me. You know what I mean? I ain't joking. I fucking, I've done loads of screws, everything. Right? But what I'm trying to say to you, when I see that, you know, fuming. And it is, it's just the way it is structured by the politicians. And it's people like you coming on here and telling your story that no doubt hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions, are going to watch this. It's you coming on here and touching people's hearts and the minds of the young people then are adjusted and they're our future leaders. Because yeah. I go in schools, you know, from inner city rough ones to the independent schools and some of those kids are going to be our leaders and they come up to me at the end of it and say, I had no idea this stuff was going on because, yeah. the, like I said, the TV just show... It's the living in luxury in the prisons. Yeah. And on the other uh, and Cat, all so Cat D's, but not Cat Gary A's. I mean, when you're, when you're Cat Gary A, I mean, uh, you, you do get it. I mean, but what was a typical day in Cat A, a like? 23, I bang up. So what, could you just, just take people there, like describe what you sell, your conditions? Imagine a room this size. Yeah. And in that time, we just had a bucket and a bed. 23 hours a day, you get out for an hour. And then you get your food brought to you, and then um, if you're lucky, you get a bath. And um, you know, but what I'm trying to say to you is like a dog, and you're poking it with a stick, and then they wonder why people come out and they get and they go berserk. Right? Do you know what I mean? So what I'm trying to say to these kids, you know, don't learn from my experience. See what happens. What a lot of people do? They get nicked, and they get they get banged up. Someone stabs someone, right? They go bang, stab it. I can stab you. Can stab me. He, the smallest geese can walk up and stab me and kill me stone dead. For two minutes, you, 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 yeah, this, this, that, right. That person's lost his, the person's died, his family's lost him, so they're, they're all grieving. The kid who's now killed him don't realise what this kid's in front. If he starts kicking off and be if he gets through the two, three years, the first year he's bouncing around the wing, yeah, yeah, yeah. Second, not my mate's just going through it now. Second year, their wives start leaving and their money runs out. They're caught up in the drug world. They don't know what to do. So what happens then, these kids have got long prison sentences, all go off the rails, they end up this, they're all getting this, and they'll start chopping themselves up, killing themselves, and all things like that. That's what the government cleans up, right? Because you're just an animal. They don't give a fuck about you, right? At the end of the story. And most kids doing life sentences have mental issues. Most people come out of prison after long time sentences have mental issues, right? So, well, someone like myself, unless you've been there and wore the T-shirt, which I have, and tell the stories, no one's going to understand it. Do you know what I mean? So when, when you're sitting in a cell 23 hours a day, down a block, and you've got 20 screws down the end, come into your cell, right helmets on, stand with your back to the wall, blur, 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 and you try and get back into society, it's, I, I come out eight in the world. I, I did, I fucking did. I, you know, I feel like I could stab. It's just, that's why you've got to get that out of people and you've got to help them through society. But also, when that person's lost that person who's been killed, you also got to take, if they can sit down and say to these kids, you just killed my boyfriend, my son. That kid who's just killed him, after a few years, he's going to turn around and go, fucking hell, I'm so sorry. Because he don't realise what he's done. You've got some fucking idiot sit, 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 singing songs, going, pick up the gun, shoot someone, stab someone, blah, blah, blah. He ain't doing the bird. 
He's, and this poor bastard been killed because he's caught. And that's what's happening in society today. They're just killing each other for nothing. Not so bad. Lucky enough, the virus quite quieted it all down, isn't it, Sean? There ain't been so many killings. Is there one just been killed up the road to us today outside a petrol station? He got stabbed to death as yet last night, eight o'clock. So we're back on the a, on a, on a treadmill again, you know? From my research into the drug laws then, because drugs are illegal, the black market gets bigger every year. So the profits gets bigger every year for criminal organisations. And then you've got everything from knife crime in London, what the media doesn't report, is a lot of it is drug gangs. I've spoke to undercover cops who've been on here and everything, ex-cops, and um, a lot of it, they're saying the media isn't saying it, but it's, it's to do with them fighting over the profits in the drugs. So by having drugs illegal, everything from knife crime in London, a lot of it, to all these people dying in Mexico, the government has created this monster. We should make it legal. We've got to make it legal. Yeah. See, what happens now, we're talking about it now, and we're going to go, oh, oh, oh. in 100 years' time, it will be legal. Yeah. Because it's the only way around it. You can't beat it. Uh, otherwise, it's just going to turn the society apart, and that's what's happening. The guy who just got killed in America with the knee on his neck, if you're a black guy and the cop's going to pull you over some, for some weed, you think the cop's going to shoot you next? All oh, this is coming out of drug laws oh, as well. well. Change the world. That, yeah. that change the world. Yeah. That's sad. Change so, the um, change the world. You mentioned about the prison guards. Because you were so well respected, I imagine that you didn't have enemies in prison. But no. on the other side, sometimes people see a tough guy and they think, I'm going to try it on him and, and, and fight him and I'm going to make my name. Did anyone come at you like that? I don't really have a lot of trouble because what happens, I try and get on with everyone. I mean, even outside, we don't really have a lot of trouble with anyone. You know, I stick to the rules, old school. It's like we do debt collecting. The money goes back to the person. We don't even touch the money. The money gets paid back to them. We don't, we don't go and break people's legs or punch people in the face and all that. We work on paperwork and things like generally do things properly. The police can't say we're bullying anyone. We're not threatening anyone. Do you know, people I work with, we work with sheriffs, we do all the legal stuff, we do our own debts, things like that, and security. Most of our security is working to save people from getting hurt, people getting bullied, the old granny down the road. We do a lot of things and step in and say to these kids, stop fucking bullying old people. You know, we, we do a lot of good things behind behind the scenes, like cancer, we've done like, you know, like when, when this virus come out, I bought a load of masks. I went to every old pensioner's house in my road and give them all masks, every one of them. And they go, what are you giving me a mask for? I just take the masks. Do you know what I mean? Because we do worry about society. And when I'm standing in a queue, and there's an old granny behind me, I pay for their food. And, they, and half of them get, get the zigger with it. And they go, why are you buying my food? They don't understand it. I go, because I want to buy you the food. They go, why? And they can't understand it, you know. And that's how society has swung round. And like I said, we're getting back to the prison situation. Is if you don't cause it, you still gonna, this will never ever go away. Like drugs, we've got to legalise drugs, take the money away from crime, put it into the national wealth, put that money into that, monitor drug takers. If you're going to take a bit of coke, you'll be all right. I'm on a bit of coke today, right, good luck. As long as you don't OD, thank you. That'll cost so so straight to the national wealth, straight to the government. He's safe. The government's safe. They earn a few quid out of it, rather than some junkie down the street shooting something out of his arm, laying in dying in a flat. All these other crack dealer cunts and all that, and these fucking herring sellers, right? They're the ones who cause trouble, not the, not the puffers and all that, right? It's the crackers and the fucking the herring what causes all the grief. And they don't get hold of it. He's going to send a junkie. A junkie will come out of prison, rob, steal, and lie to your face. These smackheads. You know what I mean? They the sad will. thing is, they become junkies in prison. A lot of them. <sighs> oh, yeah, I'm not prepared to say that. But at the end of the story, I saw a lot of people come in for weed possession. Low level drug possession and end up injecting heroin and injecting crystal meth where I was housed. And then about two thirds of them ended up with hepatitis C. Well, this is a fact, right? I don't know this for a fact, and I shouldn't say this, right? The old school started to fall apart like a corner shop person selling drugs to kids, right? They go in prison and they make, they haven't got the codes what we've got. They haven't got these people, they haven't got codes. Anyone who sells drugs to kids, they haven't got codes. Anyone who sells everything to fucking people, they haven't got codes. 
you know what I mean? They haven't got codes. As far as, you know, everyone has a bit of puff, everyone likes a bit of Charlie, fucking judges like me. But that smack and that crack, there's no returns. They just fucking take you to, they just don't know what they're going to do. It's destruction, isn't it? You know that, Sean. Yeah, yeah. You've been in prison, you know yeah, what it's yeah. like. And then not switch you. We've, we've, unless they get it under control, don't hide away like this jumps up Ponce's MPs, right? Face reality, get it down on the statutory books, make it legal. If they, like they'd done it a little while ago, there was on telly, there was, there was actually uh, festivals going, right, give us your drugs, let's taste them, make sure, and then let them out. Yeah. A lot of people got criticised for it. I thought it was a good idea. I think it's a brilliant idea. Like decriminalise zones where they test the pills so they yeah. don't take toxic substances. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think if they don't get hold of it, we're always going to have crime. We're always going to have people getting killed. Do you know what I mean? Because drugs d drugs is a bad thing, isn't it, really? It is, really is. Over the years in UK prison then, did you see the drug scene in prison change? <sighs> well, not to say, because obviously, like, they go, oh, he's a fucking wrong and all that. But yeah, of course he does. But like, at the end of the story, you know, people, they've got to get to grips with it outside. You know, I mean, not being funny, right? You know, I'm watching, I've got Netflix now, we're watching these cartels, all these silly guys chopping people's heads off for a bit of money and all that, you know. Let's legalise it. Let's get the crime taken out of it. And it, and half the crime will go away overnight. And you've got to save, and out of that crime, you'll probably save 100, 100 lives a year. Save 100 people getting killed down to drugs, probably more, Sean. 300 people, you know. A lot of people I talked to on the deep end of drug use in prison said, you know, they'd been traumatised as kids and they were getting re-traumatised by the prison system. You did over two decades. How did you stay mentally strong and not was fall it, into, you know, anything was, like that? I'd be very lucky. I'm a key, I'm like, at the time, I was a key fit fanatic. I'd train twice a day, you know, and that, anyone in prison tell you, that as long as you're training... You get your bald egg and your bit of tuna. So that was the you know, if you had a bit of chicken and been all that about nice food. Fucking hell, they joking. So, what was a typical day for you like then with your food and your training in your in your room? Well, if you could get out, you'd go training, come back, and if, if the, top, the top, if you was a cleaner, you could get out and you clean up. You know, that's what that was the best job in, a, in a, you could get. If not, you was banged up twenty four hours a day, and you'd get out and train. But most of the prisons, you was released. In they called what happens in. When you're a category A, you can only go to, at the moment, it's four, Franklin, Long Larton, Full Sutton, Whitemore. They're called dispersal prisons. You have to do over five years to get into dispersal prison. By going to dispersal prisons, that's your eighth factory. That's where all the violence committed. That's where you get some nuts. So you're standing there. I mean, that Black Panther, the one who killed uh, the three, um, three, remember he killed three, uh, the Black Panther, Donald Nielsen, his name was. What an arse licking cunt that was. Fucking hell. I mean, was, oh, yes, sir, three bags. Of, what are you doing here, Donald? Yes, sir. Fuck, I'll go, fuck up, you little mug. He was a, he was a proper cock sucking. He was screws, mate. He's so far up their arse, I had to pull him out of a pair of tweezers, a cunt. <laughs> You know, you know, brand nose, that brand nose, proper brand nose. You know, want to be a criminal, come and suck dick in there, mate. He's like a proper brand nose to come, you know. And so at the end of the story, like, look, look, I was a subversive, right, in prison, right? I'd done all my prison sentence. I wasn't a model prisoner, right? I've got to be truthful. I was involved in loads of tear ups, riots, things like I've been on the units and things like that, right? So I'm not a model prisoner. I knew I was never going to get parole, never, right? They don't like me. I've got a solicitor called David Turner. He said, I've never known someone hated more than you by the police at the time. He goes, you better fuck off. When I got acquitted that contract, murder, he said, you better fuck off. So I'd go and live in Spain for a year. So he said, I'm telling you now, get out. They're going to set you up. You know, so uh, when you're category A, when you go to court, you've got all these big escorts. I was a remand prisoner and I was in Whitemore dispersal as a remand prisoner. I was waking up the old fucking prison at six o'clock in the morning with helicopters to take me court. So you get a jury sitting there with helicopters going around, armed jury, fucking all up there. They could trying to get you guilty before you even start. That was for one call, Sean. I picked the phone up. They said I, I ordered it. I didn't know nothing about it. Fucking gonna lock me up for the rest of my life. They've put the helicopters, blocking off roads, fucking just to try and get me a guilty. So what I'm trying to say to you, I, I, my, when you live, it's like you can't talk in your car. Let's get to 
let's get to the bugging song. Let's let's talk and be honest with you. Most of buggings and people committed crimes now are all done by surveillance, aren't they? Yes. My, my case was a wiretap case. Yeah, but as you know now, they've in the old bill, you can't get no better in their intelligence, can you? They love a bug up, don't they? They do, though, don't they? You've got all the time in the world to play with the toys as well. They've got all the resources, yeah. Yeah, so you know. Have you got a phone? Anyone got a phone? Yeah, we all got phones, yeah. Right, I want to show you something. On tape, so you're going to know this, all you kids out there. That is a phone. That there, yeah, phone, yeah. When you go like that, that signal goes straight up to a satellite, bounces the way down here. They will tell you that you've been 50 feet of this building to 100 feet, right? So every time you push that button, that will tell exactly where you are, right? That's before you start. So that that the police will come after this and they will try and take your phone because they will tell you where you've been, what you've done and what you read. Now, a lot of you silly fuckers out there all talk on your phones, all texts which you can get back to you, oh, delete my texts. They can get them 10 years back later, right? So see these here? These are fucking bugs, right? So any of you out there think you're clever fuckers, that will put you in prison, all right? For the rest of your life, whatever you put on your phone, delete it or not, and your computer, cops can access that, it's there forever, a record of it. It's got these people thinking they can just send a text, I can buy some of this, I'll, I'll, delete it, or the cops can't read it now. Is this I, a fucking record of this stuff yeah. forever? I was locked up, I had no phone, no phone chip, I was under a camera, which was 10 minutes out, I had an earpiece in, and they said I made the call, that, that I received the call. I was locked up for a year. I split up with the girl I was with at the time, with my kid. Did I get a sorry? Did I bollocks? Did they try and lock me up for the rest of my life? Yes, they did. The geezer went in prison. It was He didn't even kill the geezer. He got fitted up because he's done life before, right? So what I'm trying to say, they don't like you. Them police don't like you, mate. That's why you have to live like you live now. You have to be what you what you what you say in that say someone's training and you're trying to go and they think you're up to something, they go, right. And what did you do today? I've done 130 key bench today. Oh brilliant. They'll take out 130 key, you'll take out the bench. So it leaves 130 key. It's very clever. And they go, miss and what there's a word called uh there's a special word what they use, right? So they just cut out words what you don't want them to cut. So you're talking away. Indiendo is the word, right? So if you've got, you got a radio on in your car and all of a sudden you're talking. I was I was sitting outside a cell. With, no, me and my co-defendant, Dave, was sitting there and, it's, and, and someone on the telly said something and the phone went on the telly. Next day, I, it, two hours later, I got... Sp no, screw walked past. I said, have you got a phone in? I went, have our bollocks. It was on the telly, right? It comes spun us, right? Looking for phones. Do you know what I mean? Misconceptions. And that's what you've got to watch. You know, you can go and get, I oh, know people, loads of people in prison doing prison sentences. They shouldn't be in there. What Vic's saying here is not only will they use your words against you, but they will twist your words into whatever they want the agenda to be that day. For example, in my case, I had a conspiracy case. So I've got over 100 co defendants. I never talked on the phone, told all my people never to talk on the phone. People were throwing my name around, hence the conspiracy. On one call, though, I did, it was just a personal use. It wasn't a trafficking thing. I said, can you get me the green drink to someone? I was ordering some personal GHB, and the cop said that was me running my marijuana business. And I ended up pleading guilty for it because the lawyer said, weed is the, less, the least of the, of the drugs system. on your indictment. Yeah. Take that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, they'll twist it, any, uh, your words into anything that suits them for their indictment. So you mentioned earlier that in prison you were a subversive. A lot of people might not understand that, and some people have seen the Bronson movie. That's what came to mind in my head when you said subversive. Is that correct? And was did you have a particular way of waging war on the guards? What happened? What happens? What what they do is it's called good or good or good order and discipline. Rule forty three. Rule forty three means you put down most most prisons when you come to jail. So I'll come to a long term jail. Because I've done quite a lot of things, that they'll go to me, you're a figurehead, we think you're trouble, and they put you in the block, which is called subversive, 
which comes under Rule 43. There's Rule 43 for nonces. There's also Rule 43 for what they do, they think called good order and discipline. What they do, they, you have to go between a ball, which is for 28 days, and they say, can you go back on the wing? And they say, no, they have to sign you off. So what they do, they say, so you have to go through three, three governors, and they say, no, we're going to keep you down here because we believe you're involved in activities. You know, and usually the activities really to get a screws, how we used to do the screws, like, obviously they, they're the only ones who actually touch your door. You know, like you lock doors. So what you used to get, like someone love a shit and just do every door down the thing. So the old screws come up, bump. <laughs> you just watch their face. It's sort of like go to turn the handle, put the key in, and go, and it's all shit on the handles. That's the other way they didn't like. The best one was like at the time we used to have flasks, and what you used to get someone um, get the flask, put all, like sh go. Sh shit in a flask basically he's like the glass you used to take the glass out and, it, and he used to go and give like a cut of phone calls cards at the time to the junkies all of a sudden a screw be standing there and bang and that's like like bombs like glass shit everywhere like when I was in Whitemore they had a lockdown and it literally brought the screws to the knees they're doing the shit ups and the famous one is when um, I actually got done for it before I was in um, I landed it's a funny story really I'll get to um when I've just after I got moved, we got moved from Brixton and they moved me to Parkhurst. But I thought I was going Parkhurst, but I, they took me to Albany. And this Albany was one of the worst jails at the time. I didn't like Albany at all. And uh, so it's funny, we come across the ferry and I've got this massive escort because they try to get me out of Brixton and all that. I've got this fucking big escort. So this, so they puts me in a cell and, it, and a screw, and an old boy comes, an old jailer, he goes to me, who are you? Who are you? He says, uh, I've never seen an escort like it. I mean, I've got like all armed police everywhere on the take me across on the ferry and everything. So he's going to me, Who are you? He said, What are you in for? And I went, Don't tell no one, mate. He went, What's that? He went, Shoplifting. So the old boy sort of looked at me like that. <laughs> sort, of, sort, of, sort of looked at me and sort of say, He sort of like, Oh, he went, and he started laughing. He realised it was a joke, like, but, that, but and then, uh, anyway, they put me to a place called Albany. So I goes in, I didn't like it. I thought, fuck it. And the best way to get out of prison or get do a screw is shit them up, right? Now, when you shit screw up, you what you do, you have a whip round. So you go around all the cons and they all have a pony and they put in a bucket and you stir it around, piss, shit and everything like that. And you give, a good, give it a good old stir, right? And um, so I'm in there. So there was this, So I thought, well, how the fuck I want to get out of here? I want to go to Parkhurst. I don't want to stay in Albany. I want to go to Parkhurst, right? So I applied. They said, no, you're going to stay here. So I thought, I'm not staying here. So I come out on the wing. So I went out to sit to the boys. said, right, let's have a shit round. So they were all shit in the bucket and that. So I woke up in the morning. I thought, I'll get me breakfast first. Wait, they got me breakfast. And I thought, the next time I'm out, I'm going to shit a screw up, right? So and in Long Island, it was like, uh, no, in Albany, it was like corn as it was. So I was waiting. And anyway, the screw was standing, and I, the door opened up, I thought, here we go. So the screw was just standing, I walked up, put a bucket of shit literally on the top of his head, went like that, mind you, I got done and all, I didn't realise he was going to hit me and all, and I went like that on his head, sort of like, sort of thing. And then as I took the bucket off, I just hit him on the head with a bucket a couple of times, right? So I thought, oh, fuck, I'm going to smash the bits here, right? Anyway, the right bell went, everything, and I was going, bang up, bang up. So the old screw, he got it in his eyes and his ears, got the fucking lot. And I've got that, I don't realise I've been shitted up myself, like, so I've got it and all. So imagine now, they take me down the block, I think I'm going to get kicked to fuck. They didn't touch me, I couldn't believe it. Just put me in a block, kept me down there for four, four weeks, five weeks. I think I lost five months thingy which didn't bother me because I knew I was going to get it back I ended up in Parkhurst which I was there for two years eight months so it was the best shit up I've ever done and I got me time back you know so uh, and then uh, obviously when you asked me about prisons like I said it was when strange ways went uh, Alan Lord and uh, another kid they battered him they made him into a vegetable basically the other one who got 10 years we interviewed um, Alan Lord me and Wildman yeah, up, nice up north bloke, Alan, yeah, yeah Alan hell Lord. of a story where he's on the run running yeah. through windows and jumping through windows and stuff yeah they've done well there yeah. so when, when Strange Waves went there was about 25 prisons went with it and we was one of them I, I got moved to um, I was in a place called Full Sutton and a some nonce he, 
he was sitting, he'd done two kids, and he, two kids went to stab him. He, he, got, he got the knife off and stabbed the two kids. Anyway, mysteriously, this kid who'd done the two things, he got it with a a rolling pin across his nose and knocked out like that. And he got battered anyway. So they believed it was me and a couple of other people anyway. So all of a sudden, the door's gone. It's really funny, really, because you have wedges in the time. You have wedges in prison. So um, I had a wedge in. All of a sudden, the door went, this is about five in the morning. <laughs> like that. So I thought, fuck, I was laying on the bed. So I knew, as soon as you hear the bang, you know, the, the, the right shield, the fucking helmets and all that. I could hear the, all the helmets moving up and all that. So that's when they take you out of the, the cell. And there's all, all lit, lined up like the... Imagine Roman Saturnian soldiers, and I think, someone's going to batter me. I'm going to get with a truncheon here and all that, right? So anyway, so he marched me out. I come out of the cell, and they walked me down now. And I thought, someone's going to hit me with a baton, and they just put me in put me in a van. At the time, was going, but it was, they didn't have A vans. They just had an ordinary coach, but you was handcuffed like that. So he goes to me, um, I'll go and Lincoln, this Lincoln block, right, which was this, where they bash you up. This Lincoln block was notorious for... And if you went Lincoln Blue, as soon as you landed there, you got a kick in. But I got this fucking massive big escort with me because of the trouble over Brixton, all the trouble I've had. And I got a massive escort. So Screw goes to me, you know what you're going there, don't you? And I went, I went, why? He went, you're going to get dealt with. I went, why do you feel I'm going like this, mate? You fucking prick, all right? Anyway, so uh, I gets to the prison, which was a local prison. They're like little old prisons. So because I was a double A cat. And I'm stamped not to go to local prisons, right? So the old Bill now confused. Where did Russia sat in the riots? They've put in like, I'm not allowed to be there. So they've got the old Bill actually coming with me to the prison and took me into the segregation unit. As I walked through the door, it was all screwed with their hats down like that, all waiting to give me, going to bash me up, weren't they? All going to fucking beat the shit out of me. But because I walked in with the armed police to put me in the block, and I can, I can hear where the controls going. He's not supposed to be here. What, why is this man at a local prison? Because I'm not allowed because of the escape from Brixton. And I'm a double A cat, which they don't take like double A cats in a local prison. So I gets in there. They put what's me in the block. So that's the first time, really, I was pleased to see our police because they brought me in there. And, and all of a sudden, the door opens. Like, this fucking great big screw comes in, a prison governor. He's got great big airy chops down there. He has like a farmer. And he goes to me, you're lucky. I went, fuck off. And I heard a voice go, is that you, Vic? And I heard another voice, have you, Vic? Because now all the rioters have ended up in Lincoln Block. So there's about 20 of us in there, all the riots, all the riot kids are in there like that. And went, you fucking touch him. And all the screws are going, what the fuck's going on here? They're not, because they're under control, this control unit, everyone's scared to fucking say boo in there. And all of a sudden you've got 20 geezers all giving it, fuck you, when we get this door, we're going to fucking iron you out and all that. So the screws are like fucking bricking it. like going, So I said, so out in the middle, it goes, right, it's in the morning, they kept me there for, I think it was like two days they kept me there for. So he, he goes, uh, when you open the door, throw your food over the screws. Lucky for me, right, I was about seven screws, seven <laughs> cells down. So when the door opened up, I could hear, Shh, and then a big rush, all just go, <laughs> big fight, and all that going on. Also, wrap him up, put him in a strong box. The second door, <laughs> all over. Also, trying to get to me, they've got no more strong boxes. <laughs> I think that's the first time I was so fucking lucky. <laughs> anyway, so... Uh, so they just melted the screws. They went, so they started giving them gym. And when I got flew out there, it was the best thing they ever done because we actually changed Lincoln Control Unit for Con sticking together, which was like, Con stick together got their own power. You don't stick together, you're fucked. It's like out here, you don't stick together, you're fucked. Do you know what I mean? And that's how, how when Con stick together, you can win things. When you don't, you've got grasses, you've got this, you've got that. And that was that was a big telling story for us because when Strange Ways went, that altered, that altered the prison system. We got TVs. They come up to Parkhurst apparently when we was in there. I was asking, what if you had TVs? Would it alter your thing? And and it was like a filter through with the TVs on the phones because um, people never had TVs. We never had a TV. I had a bucket and a little Robert's radio. Radio. That's all I had. So most of my time, twenty years was done with a bucket, a little plastic bucket and a little Robert's Wrangler. That's all I had for 20 years. Locked up 23 hours a day, you know, and you wonder why you're fucking normal, like, you know? One of the most common questions that gets sent in is what happens to sex offenders in various prisons. So in Arizona, it's KOS, kill on sight. 
Um, did you have any other stories of things that happened? That, that... Well, he came on, we was in Parkhurst, and there was a fellow called Donna, this one was called Donald Nilsson. He'd killed 13 kids. He was oh. like, uh, 15 kids he'd killed. He, he chopped them up, drugged them, and then chopped them up oh. and killed them. Do you remember him? They found all the dead bodies in, a, in the, all, the, all the dead bodies in the drain. Do you remember? I remember that name. I can't remember all the details. And then what happened? Good thing with Parkhurst, right? As soon as you come to Parkhurst, it was like a thing. If you was a bacon bonce, normal people would get a blue plate. A sex offender would get a yellow plate. So when you come out, so what happens when you got to reception? So when you landed in the prison, when you come down for your breakfast in the morning, as soon as you knew. That yellow plate, you knew as a sex offender, right? So by the time they got from their cells to the camp where you used to get served food, he'd either get it with a snooker ball, smashed over the side. It'd have, like, that's what happened to Donald Nielsen. As soon as he walks in now, they went, fucking Donald Nielsen's here. And he was quite tall, this Donald Nielsen. I was quite shocked the one who killed the 15 kids. So I was on I was on level two and he was on level one. This was in Parker's. I leant over like that and went... You fucking animal cunt. And with that, mate, there was chin, fucking snooker balls. <laughs> like, he ran up and put his the numbers. We wouldn't have, that was a good thing with Parkers. You never had no sex offenders or no bad cunts in there, right? Because as soon as you met, as soon as met, we had committees. And what happens, you'd come in there and they'd go, where's your statements, mate? It, unless they knew you, he was all right. But then, say like you walked in, they didn't know. He said, let's have a look at your depositions. And that's how Parkers was when I was there at the time. And it was like the most, I've written one of the most staunchest jails there was in in the British system, you know, like you was vetted by your own cons, you know. Today, they let anyone on the wings do anything, don't they? Who were the highest profile prisoners you were housed with? Uh, what well known ones? Well known, like Bronson, yeah. Yeah, there was Charlie. There was uh, Kenny Noy. All of them, really. Anyone, anyone, anyone was any anyone really? Or we got a lot of Ian Blink McDonald fans watch these videos. Got any Blink stories? Oh, me and him were like piss heads. We used to love a drop of Ooch, me and him. And then uh, we was in Franklin's and every time I bumped into him, we used to go in the cells and we used to make our own Ooch. And me, we used to get fucking pissed as farts. That's how I'd done most of my prison sentences. When I was out, when we was out on the wings, you could have a drink, you could make your drink out of pure orange, you'd get a bit of yeast. And uh, we used to make our own drinks and that, you know. And that's, that's how I got through my prison system. Every Saturday it'd be like, uh, it's funny because, you know, it, mysteriously someone had a daughter Anyway, so we was in Parkhurst and um, they got congratulated, but the party went on, we banged up at night, it went on to about 11 o'clock that night. And uh, it was like, and the daughter was, anyway, the, the jail didn't get smashed up, anyway, I oh, fucking nearly got moved and all that. And uh, it was like, it was, it was like, best time you could have in prison was Parkhurst, without a doubt, you know. I like Parkhurst. Didn't Blink tell us a story about doing ecstasy in prison, Eckies. I think he was talking about some crazy stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it, like with me, I was just, I was just hooch. Hooch. Yeah. So in Arizona, we cooked it because the wall was hot, snow yeah. and desert, and, it, and you have to burp, yeah. you have to burp the bag. That's how it fermented because of yeah. the heat. Yeah. How does it? How do you cook it in the UK if it's not hot? What we used to do is get orange, pure orange juice and get yeast in. You can make yeast, bread yeast, and that. You throw it. It's it come out a lot of vodka orange. It was brilliant. I was a brew, it was a brew monster. And when I was in uh, Frank, I used to get dustbins, get all the all the all the yeast from the prisons, out the, out the, for the bread yeast to make fucking big, you know, the big black dustbins. We used to make the oots full of that. So I used to do the old wing, we all be out there partying and all that. <laughs> Things have changed now, though. But that was fun. We did have a good time. The best time you could have in prison was then, you know. We used to have good times. I think prison's changed so much now, you know, but that's how I got through my time drinking hooch, basically. So you mentioned some of the guard brutality already. Are there any other stories that you've not told us of a guard brutality? I think, I think, my personal opinion, we had nothing. I didn't really talk to screws. I, I wasn't really, um, you had a lot of people, I'd hate to say it, I, fucking by their first names, best friends and all that shit, but I wasn't really, I didn't like them, they didn't like me. So really, basically, um, just bullies really, basically. I went to Liverpool. I mean, that was probably one of the worst places I've ever seen. For that Walton? Yeah, that was a fucking, oh, mate, I walked through the doors on you, I want to try and smash you up. And then uh, most, most prisons have got their DST team, see. Now, we're going back to um, George Floyd. Now, when on videos, they actually show you grabbing a prisoner around the neck like that and dragging him out of the cells. That's how they do it. 
right? Now, you know what's just happened to George Floyd. Nine minutes, they had him around the neck and killed him. That was disgusting, right? That goes on all the time. That goes on in the prison system. And the big, the good thing about what's going on at the moment, what's all these things, what they're doing, can change the system. They're not allowed to do headlocks no more. So the more they stand up for themselves, the better for us. Not just blacks or whites, all together. We've got to stick together. And if it stops pr police brutality and the way they do things, like picking on people, you know, and the way they rough you up and all that, and they do rough you up. I mean, I'll stand at court, and um, it was a right flash one, and he, was, he, he, wanted a, he wanted to pick a fight with me for some unknown reason. You could see it, like, you know, don't do this, don't do that. He tried to grab, he grabbed me like that, and I was, I was just... Took his arm over like that, and another cock grab took his arm over like that, another one swept him down the floor. I mean, leave it out. And they trying to chick him up, you know. And um and that, and that was for nothing. That's because like and then when I, the, the worst kicking I had I was I got three years. And um the screw was sitting next to me, I got done for a stabbing, and um the screw was sitting next to me was right through the case. You know, my family's can't give me this, give me that. And the day I got sentenced, my girlfriend went to me, uh, some pictures of me like, to take back to jail. So as I went to take the pictures, the screw smashed my hand. So as I went like that, I naturally went, it's called a racken, like that. That's all it was, that. But when I hit him, I went on the side of the head there. So he's gone down. So I thought, oh, fuck. So he's got up like so I grabbed him like that and the right bells went. This is snares with Crown Court. I've got three years. So I thought, oh fuck. So I know what's gonna happen now. So I ends up in Wandsworth. So they put me in this box, and it was like a metal box, and look, the lid come down. So screw goes to me, think you're a tough guy, do you? So I thought, oh fuck. And at the corner of my eye, I could see the normal cons in the normal boxes, and they were taking them out, they called like giving their food, take them, taking their arms all that, and kept me in this metal box. So I know what's coming. So I know it's all right, Stevie. So uh, I'm the last one out. So I comes out, comes out the, uh, uh, comes out the box. And there's about six, seven screws standing down the bottom. So he goes to me, right, take your clothes off, strip off, right. So I looked at him and I thought, I was a game cunning. I thought, I thought I'd rather get a kick in my clothes on with kicking without my clothes on, right. <laughs> so, so the kids goes, did you what I said? Take your clothes off. I went, nah. I went, take your fucking clothes off, right. So I said, no, and it, cool, that was it. Like, same thing, steamed into him. Oh, mate, I got fucking battered. Unlucky for me, the segregation units are usually, like, not too far where you get done. This was a GH and K. It was on a total different wing. So they, they fucking kicked me from one end to the other. So I was in Wandsworth. I was there. In, I was in down the block for six months. I had block visits for six months. I mean, when they battered, when they battered me, I mean, and what they did, I had the kick in. Then they went away, and in, at about half hour later, the door opened up again, and they had this mattress. With, they didn't have the right things at the time, and he run me against the wall, these screws, and the only thing sticking out was me, uh, my leg, like that. And he had a truncheon. He was smashing my leg, ankle, and, he, and, you know, and, and I'm joking. When you get it on your ankle with a truncheon about three or four times, I had a leg like that, and my leg didn't heal for 18 months. I could hardly do it for 18 months. And I, put, I think that was probably the most... Bad and bit, you know, I'd be nosed where I'd ring smashed in my face, but I think that was probably the worst I've got hurt in prison, you know what I mean? Um, and like most of the time, you know, they look if you're gonna hit one, you're gonna hit it back, put it that way. So, so you know, you're gonna smack a screw, they're gonna smack you back. So, you, you, as soon as you smack a screw, you know, you're gonna get a kick in. Most of the time, when you did have confrontations with screws, um, you know, like. Some some go right, 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 and some want to hurt you, do you know what I mean? But, like, they think you can have a round. See, the trouble is when, when you're taking on someone who's in prison and they know you, you're liked, it's very unlikely they're going to beat you up. But if you're not liked and no one likes you in the prison system, they'll beat you up, put it that way. Do you know what I mean? That's that's how I see prison, you know. Like, you, you can get bullied. And what I didn't like towards the end, because of these druggy cunts, they make you squat. They make you squat. And then... um. I got acquitted of a. Uh, I got acquitted at Winchester, and this kid, as I landed, someone had cut himself up, and the screw went to me. Oh, so and so just cut himself up, and we didn't do a good job, did he? And I looked at him, I thought, "You fucking for real, mate? He's chopped himself up, and he said he didn't do a good job." 
I'm getting released the next morning. And then another screw go, we tried to hang himself, didn't do, didn't do a good job, did he? And I thought, hold on, mate, you're supposed to be looking after these people. Mm. They're fucking chopping themselves up, killing themselves. And because they ain't killed themselves, they haven't done a good job. I thought, where, who's the animal, me or you? It's true, isn't it? Psychopath. Yeah. What about Charles Bronson's stories then? <sighs> well, he's what he is, isn't he? He's the man, isn't he? But I'm not, not being funny. With Charles, he hasn't killed anyone. He hasn't hurt anyone. How can you keep him banged up for all these years? I mean, if he'd have killed someone, I can understand it. He don't deserve to be in prison, never in a million years. You know what I mean? So at the end, sort of, look, he deserves to be in prison, but it's time to let him out now. He's got to come out, and he? He's got to come out. He hasn't killed anyone. I mean, it's fucking disgusting what they're doing. They're keeping him in the cage. He's another one who could take to the side. He's a brilliant artist. Get some universities. Get, let him take him out to the universities. Let him do his paintings. Try to understand the fella, not fucking keep him in a cage. Because that's what they do. And underneath that, Charlie Bronson, he's a fucking gentleman. He really is a nice bloke. I liked him. I thought he was all right. Did you ever work out with him? He had a different workout. He loves press-ups and things like that, or more bar and things like that, and bag work. He, he's more like press-ups, a press-up nut, isn't he? And did you see the, him, um, the guards attack him? Oh, mate, yeah. He's, a, uh, he's got that mad strength, and he's got that mad strength. But uh, like I say, I just like to see him released. So... In terms of riots, then, were you involved in any riots? Or did you see any riots, rather? Let's phrase it that way. <laughs> loads of riots. I mean, fucking hell, we're, we're, there's a riot every fucking week in now. I mean, we had a massive big fat punch up in uh, Franklin. He was in it, Charlie. And like, we run them. And then, uh, yeah, like all the time. What are the riots over? It's funny, really, because Paul laughs about this, Paul Ferris, right? Prime example. He's got a brother called Billy Ferris. Now, Bill, we've been friends with Bill for a long time. So I get up one morning, Dan Mason, you go just walk down, get your breakfast and go back. This is our right start. All of a sudden, I've come out, come out of a pair of shorts, top, gone down to get me breakfast. All of a sudden, Billy's there, Billy Ferris. I ain't in that fucking shit. That's it. <laughs> he's locked in now. You can't walk away. You've got to stand with him. You can't let people jump on him because he's there. That's how a riot starts. And then from that moment, the trouble just starts. <laughs> and it's just as simple as that. You can walk into a riot without even you know you're going to walk into trouble or a riot. It kicks off. You know, it just, just escalates. You know, it usually starts with a fight or another fight, two inmates fighting, and it just mass turns into a massive big brawl. And then that's how riots start. That's how they do start. It's very rare they're planned. They're not really going to sit down. Oh, we, we have the sit downs. We have all that. I've been loads of sit downs. And, uh, you know, we've been in loads of sit downs. And like I said, but with, with um, riots, they're very sparky. Do you know what I mean? They kick off when you don't expect them to kick off. That's how they start, really. You know. Yeah, in Arizona, they just grab like a fire extinguisher sized canister of the spray and come in and just spray everybody like that is yeah. that how they, they deal with it here no they, they what they do they get the shields banging them and they have all the right shields and they come in like i was in uh we was in whitemore and was having a drink in a cell and a screw comes and he goes uh there's a fire next door he said you've got to bang up so i expected like a cell being on fire so i stuck my head out like that fucking our wings are light i went you were you gonna ask me to bang up he went yeah you've got to go and bang i said i ain't fucking banging up and also I was with a fella called Billy Williams. He, he was just a spar with Cassius Clay and all that. And he said, no, we ain't fucking banging up. And they would have made us bang up. And so the old, the old prison would have burnt down, would have fucking died. So we wouldn't bang up. And that's how trouble just starts. It's exactly like that. That's what prison's like. You can walk down the landing one minute, the next minute you're in a big fight or whatever. That's how prison is. It's combustible. Yeah. We've had a few people come on, have been in prison, and they've said they've seen corpses or they've saved people's lives who are trying to kill themselves, things like that. Anything like that you come across? Oh, I see loads of people dead, and it's not nice. I mean, they're hanging cells, when they hang their cells, cut their cells, I mean, look, you know, it's it's not a nice thing. You know, it's a bit sad for me. I don't really want to talk about it. Really. I hear you. Yeah. You know. You cut off your earlobes. <laughs> yeah. What was that about? Vainous. Vainous? Yeah, just vainous. Yeah. Vanity. Vanity, yeah. And how we've talked about all of the um, the helping the young people, poverty leading to crime, knife crime. We've talked about how we can help offenders. You've talked about your films, why you turn to crime. Are there any other stories you think that or anything you want to say before we wrap it up? No, thanks for the interview, Sean. Yeah. Um, I wish you all the best. And like I say yeah. to all the kids out there, what I like to talk about at the moment is knife crime. 
it's the last thing I like to end it on. Um, before you stab someone, think about what you're doing because um, they're going to egg you on the fight. Most kids do; they can't help themselves. And school bullies and things like that they edge you on and, ch and drive kids into trying to kill themselves or hurt themselves. Just think about what you're doing. That's all I'm asking. Don't don't end up in prison because I'm not an hero and I'm far from it. Right? I'm not proud to do what I did. If I could turn my life around tomorrow, I'll turn my life around tomorrow. Go to school, learn what you're doing, and don't don't follow our routes because you're not a good route at all. And like I mentioned in the first section, we've got the link down there for the making of a money getter. If people want to go down, click on that and check it out. If people want to get a hold of you. Are you on social media or anything? Yeah, Facebook. Yeah. All right, so we're going to put Vic's Facebook down there below as well. Please let us know in the comments what you have thought about this video. Huge thank you to all of the new subscribers. Subscription logo is in the bottom right-hand corner. Huge thank you to all people who donated as well. PayPal, Patreon, just giving. Subscribe start to help us produce these podcasts in a professional studio. With James, our cameraman and joe our sound engineer and if you've got any other guest suggestions please put them in the comment section below all right i'm gonna have to give you a hug then big man thank you mate and, um, nice yeah, yeah, thank yeah. you mate. Yeah, nice yeah, yeah, thank yeah, you very much yeah, yeah. yeah thanks mate yeah, thank, thank you thank you thank you
Thank <laughs> you.